morning. I'm delighted to be here this morning uh, to be participating in this uh, TEDx UT talk. And today we're going to be discussing cancer, uh, but it's a topic that's related to cancer. I'm not going to be talking about how to cure cancer or how to treat cancer, but I'm going to be discussing uh, the issue of what happens after our patients finish their cancer treatment, this emerging topic of cancer survivorship. And so we all know in this room that cancer is an important disease to our Canadian population and is the leading cause of death here in, uh, in our country. And in fact, uh, last year, there were about a quarter of a million patients who were newly diagnosed with cancer. And unfortunately, 80,000 have succumbed to this disease. However, um, there is a good news part of the story in that there, as you can see in this slide, there's going to be an increasing number of cancer survivors year after year. And in fact, within about 40 years time in 2026, there will be 2 million cancer survivors here in Canada, about 5% of the national population. And so part of the reason is because we're doing a lot better with cancer. Uh, we're able to develop prevention strategies such as smoking cessation campaigns and improvements in lifestyle choices with regular exercises and uh, healthy uh, diet with uh, vegetables and fruits. We also have effective uh, screening programs such as mammograms for uh, detection of breast cancer and as well as colorectal or bowel cancers. And with these screening programs, patients are diagnosed well before they have any symptoms. And so these patients are highly curable. And the third and last reason is related to the improvement in treatments of cancers, all aspects of cancer treatments. Uh, and I have been privileged to witness firsthand in my three decades as a practicing cancer physician of improvements in surgery, radiation therapy, chemotherapy, molecularly targeted therapies and recently immunotherapies that have resulted in an increasing number of our cancer survivors. Now, the majority of our cancer survivors do very well and have excellent quality of life, but there is a significant minority, somewhere between 30 up to 50% of our patients who may experience some of the aftermath or the after effects of our cancer therapies. And there is a huge range of them, but the three that I'm going to be focusing on for the course of the next 15 minutes or so are fatigue, radiation fibrosis or radiation scarring, and the development of lymphedema. And these are the three topics our lab has been focusing on in the last several years. So the first topic relates to fatigue. So there is a very small minority of patients after completing their cancer therapy who will experience chronic debilitating fatigue that prevents them from being able to resume their previous occupation or resume their previous quality of life. And, it's, and fatigue is obviously a very complex topic. Who in this room hasn't experienced fatigue? And so we decided to break this problem down into a bite-sized piece and focus on just one cancer treatment and that is radiation therapy. So several years ago, we invited about 150 women with breast cancer who were undergoing radiation therapy for their disease. And we asked them to do two things. One was to complete a questionnaire um, expressing how, whether they're exp experiencing any fatigue, whether it be physical fatigue or mental fatigue, and also whether they're experiencing any anxiety or an insomnia. And this questionnaire was completed at five time points. The first was before the radiation started. The second was 24 hours after the first radiation. The third questionnaire was completed a week into the treatment. And then at the very end of the treatment, which could be three to five weeks long, and the final questionnaire was completed one month after finishing their radiation. And at the same time that they were completing the questionnaires, we were also drawing blood samples to analyze about 17 proteins to ask whether any of these proteins were able to explain some of the symptoms that our patients were reporting. And so we had three key observations from this study. The first is that the fatigue was only reported maybe by about a third or 30% of our patients. But if you receive chemotherapy, you were twice as likely to experience that fatigue. 
The second is that there were patients who had experienced anxiety and insomnia, but this really appeared only during the first week, significantly improved over the weeks of radiation and pretty well completely disappeared in the vast majority of our patients after completing radiation. And the final observation was that uh, amongst the 17 proteins that we measured, there were only about maybe three or four whereby the protein levels did appear to associate with the symptoms of fatigue and anxiety and insomnia reported by our patients. So this paper was published a few years ago, and we believe that it's, this paper is very important for three reasons. Number one, it documented that local radiation therapy can indeed cause fatigue in our patients. And secondly, that these symptoms that are experienced by our patients, it's not just in their heads, but in fact, it validated their symptoms and it validated that there is indeed a pathobiology underlying these symptoms that are experienced by our patients. And then lastly, despite the fact that we didn't have a punchline single protein that explained all these myriads of complex uh, symptoms, however, I think this provides a very important foundational base through which in the future, we would be able to design those personalized treatments for the very small minority of patients who do experience that chronic debilitating fatigue after cancer therapy. So that was the first topic, which is fatigue. The second topic is radiation fibrosis or radiation scarring. So what is that? So if you take a look at the second slide here is a picture of a patient who has had throat cancer or head and neck cancer, had received radiation treatment probably a year or two ago, and currently is undergoing surgery, likely because of cancer relapse. And so you can see that this neck is abnormal. And if we were to feel it, it would be very thick and the patient would be feeling that the neck is very stiff. So this individual may have limited ability to be able to move his neck from side to side. And also the uh, appearance of it, some patients may find it quite embarrassing. Women may wear a scarf and men may wear a turtleneck. And this sometimes can lead to a sense of social isolation and obviously a deterioration in their quality of life. And so what is behind this radiation fibrosis? So as you can see in the second slide here, fibrosis or scarring is a normal process so that when we cut our finger, for example, there's a natural healing process that goes on. But in this slide, which is a microscopic appearance of normal on the top and then abnormal on the bottom of the slide, you see that there's this excess blue color. And what that blue color represents is this protein called collagen, which is produced normally when our body is repairing any kind of wound. And so as of now, we don't know why this radiation fibrosis occurs. It's a chronic, it's irreversible, and it's permanent. And then secondly, it's very complex in that the time course is unpredictable. It may not occur and be visible until up to 18 to 24 months after completion of the radiation treatment. And as of today, we do not have a way of predicting who will or who will not develop the severe scarring after the radiation. And so there have been many conjectures that have been put forth as to why this radiation fibrosis occurs, ranging from uh, perhaps related to inflammation, is it related to a lack of oxygen to the scarred area, or is it related to a lack of blood supply? And so we do not know the answer or the full uh, explanation for this. And so several years ago, when we embarked on this research question, instead of focusing on any one specific possibility, we decided to take a unbiased or systematic big data or uh, bioinformatics approach. And we asked what were the main pathways that were different between the scarred versus the non-scarred radiation tissue. And surprisingly, at that time, we identified that it was, in fact, a metabolic dysregulation whereby the tissues that after radiation has difficulty in balancing how it manages the fat and the sugar within these key cells called fibroblasts, which are the master regulators of collagen production. So that after radiation, instead of having a balanced production and degradation, 
because of the dysregularities in how it manages the fat and the sugar, the fibroblast basically produces too much collagen and it fails to break it down so that over time there's an accumulation of this excess blue protein that you saw earlier and resulting in the thickening and the scarring and the stiffness of this tissue. So as treating physicians, we're always interested in knowing, well, how do we help our patients with this problem? And so again, we undertook a big data approach and probed the world's publicly available databases and ask, are there any existing compounds that could improve the, uh, the fibrosis? And so we indeed identified that there was a very small compound called caffeic acid, which ironically has nothing to do with caffeine, but is found in natural existing spices, such as the star anise or the uh, cinnamon. And when we gave the caffeic acid to our mice after radiation, we found that we were able to improve the scarring or the fibrosis. And there was decreased amount of this blue collagen protein, and it was mediating this benefit through the, the correction of the fat and sugar metabolic dysregulation. And so we published this paper in 2019, and the following year, we wrote a review article that actually uh, advocated for the use of these metabolic drugs to manage uh, the global epidemic of uh, basically fibrosis. So the fibrosis or the scarring that occurs in critical organs, such as our heart, our lung, our liver, our kidney, is actually responsible for the cause of death in about a third of a population around the world. And so we had advocated that if the metabolic dysregulation can be corrected, for example, using diabetic drugs that could be repurposed to manage this fibrosis or scarring of the critical organs, this would actually have a huge impact and benefit around the world. So we're not quite ready to move caffeic acid into clinical testing immediately because caffeic acid, when it's given to humans, is rapidly broken down. And so there's not enough circulating to benefit our patients. But what we have been doing in the recent years is collaborating with a drug chemist at the University of Toronto, and we're creating and synthesizing new drugs similar to caffeic acid that might be able to be much more stable and we hope to be able to advance some of these leading compounds into clinical testing, hopefully in the coming few years. So the last topic that I wanna talk about is lymphedema. So what is lymphedema? Well, lymphedema, as you can see in this slide, is a swelling of, an, of a limb. And in this particular case, we're talking about the upper arm. And this particularly affects our breast cancer survivors. And we, about a third of our breast cancer survivors may experience different degrees of this lymphedema. So the lymphedema is the accumulation of excess lymph fluid in the arm, in the affected arm. And as you can see, it, its appearance is obviously um, uh, unpleasant, um, but also patients experience heaviness in that arm. And some patients will have to wear a sleeve that presses the uh, fluid back into the central circulation. Um, and unfortunately, about a third of these patients with lymphedema might experience uh, infection once a year, uh, sometimes requiring hospitalization and clearly then leading to increased costs for the patient as well as the healthcare system. And so again, we wanted to understand what was underlying the lymphedema. And we interestingly, we find that the same process of this metabolic dysregulation of fat and sugar applies to the lymphedema. And when we administered caffeic acid, to the mice with these lymphedema conditions, we were very gratified to see that we could also uh, help to improve this condition of lymphedema. Now, one of the key differences between the lymphedema and the radiation fibrosis is that we have also developed a strategy by which we can identify the women who are at risk of developing lymphedema after completing their breast cancer therapy. And these are five parameters that are readily available in patients' medical records. So the first is age. So the older our patients, the higher the risk of developing lymphedema. The second is body mass index. So that the higher the BMI, the higher the risk of lymphedema. The third is the number of lymph nodes which are involved with cancer, higher numbers, higher risk. 
The fourth is the number of lymph nodes that are removed at the time of the breast cancer surgery. Again, higher number, higher risk. And the fifth parameter, which is a new parameter, is actually what the mammogram looks like at the time of the breast cancer diagnosis, so that the fattier the breast appearance on mammogram also associated with a higher risk of developing lymphedema. So that with this conglomerate of these five clinical, clinically readily available parameters, because we, these tests, if you will, doesn't cost an extra penny to our system, we're able to identify those 30% of breast cancer survivors who are at risk of developing lymphedema. And the importance is that once we identify a drug that we would like to advance into clinical testing, we could invite just the 30% of the patients who we know are at risk of developing lymphedema, and therefore they're the ones who are potentially going to be able to benefit the most from these kinds of new treatments. So in conclusion, I hope I've been able to share with you some of the exciting developments in our clinics and in our labs which we hope to be able to benefit our cancer survivors. So then in the future, when I'm sitting down and explaining cancer therapy to our patients, I can reassure them that they will be able to live longer without cancer. But very importantly, I can also assure them that they no longer need to be in fear of the development of some of the after effects of their cancer treatments, such as fatigue, radiation fibrosis or scarring or lymphedema. So thank you all for your kind attention.